Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are waiting on just a few more participants to join us here on Zoom. Thank you for your patience. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Hello everyone, we're now ready to get started. Commissioners and panelists, you may now start your audio and your video. So how are we doing everybody? I think isn't we're good, Chairman. Isn't technology amazing? So welcome, um, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, see you all again and and uh, to make some new friends today. Uh, my name is uh, Pedro Nava, and I'm the chair of the Little Hoover Commission. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on COVID-19 uh, and children's uh, mental health. Tristan Stein, who I see, uh, on screen there, hello Tristan, has served as the project manager for the commission's study on the impacts of COVID-19, and he will be moderating uh, our webinar. Uh, today, we look forward to presenting recommendations our commission already developed and approved as part of our reports on the pandemic's impact on the mental and emotional well-being of children and adolescents. Uh, we're honored to be joined by representatives from two organizations, who have dedicated themselves to improving the lives of children. Christine Stoner Mertz of the Alliance of Child and Family Services, welcome, as well as uh, Ted Lampert and LaShawn Francis of Children Now. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests for sharing their time and their expertise uh, with us. We are recording uh, today's webinar, and after the webinar, staff will place a permanent link to the recording on our website and upload it to our YouTube channel uh, and Facebook page. And now to the substance of today's webinar. Uh, in our report, COVID-19 and Children's Mental Health, addressing the impact, the Commission urges California to strengthen its system for supporting youth mental health. Today, we will discuss this call to action. Uh, first, uh, Vice Chair Sean Barner, who's a member of the subcommittee studying the state's recovery from the pandemic, as well as Commissioner David Beyer, who also served on the study subcommittee, will share some of the Commission's research and recommendations. Uh, and with that, uh, let me turn this over to uh, Vice Chair Varner. Well, thank you, Chair Nava, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll be giving you just a little overview of uh, what the Little Hoover Commission has done um, with regard to COVID over the past, I guess it's been two years now. Um, at the onset of the pandemic, um, actually a little maybe prior to the pandemic, uh, Commissioner Beyer uh, came to the commissioners and indicated that uh, he saw something coming. There was that there was an issue that was arising that is going to be of critical importance to the state of California, and that was uh, this pandemic called COVID. Um, it, he, it's amazing that he saw that he had the foresight and we were able to jump on the issues that COVID would um, potentially <clears throat> have devastating effects on our on our economy, on our um, on our employees and and our children. And so 
the Little Hoover Commission ended up dividing its study, uh, its study into three reports. The first and second reports discussed how we could um, best support small business and workers that, that were impacted by the, by the pandemic. And then today we'll be discussing our third report, which focused on the pandemic's impact on the mental and emotional well-being of children and adolescents, which, as most of you know, was already a, um, a major issue in California prior to the pandemic. And this just put a spotlight on it. And, and we heard testimony throughout the, this study that um, was, was really devastating to hear. Um, and so, um, what we found was that COVID created a perfect storm of stress, anxiety, and trauma in the, in the children within our state. Um, many young people experienced social, social uh, isolation, disconnection, which I think they were already um, uh, suffering from somewhat with regard to social media and the lack of, um, of human interaction when, um, when people are on their devices. But this just showed that um, additional measures are in social distancing, remote learning, um, that separated from their fr friends and family, further exasperating the issue. Um, some of the youth also grapple daily with the anxiety over uh, the safety of family members who are essential workers or um, with stress from parents' loss of income. I mean, they, they're there and they see that happening. Um, and tragically, many of them are, uh, are dealing with grief from the loss of loved ones uh, as a result of, of COVID-19. Um, we also understand that uh, the pandemic likely disproportionately impacts the mental and emotional well-being of uh, children from communities of color and low-income communities, disadvantaged communities. Um, and um, those, those communities have essentially borne the brunt of the pandemic's economic and physical um, health effects. Um, we also learned uh, that COVID's impact comes on top of pre-existing crisis in children's mental health, like I mentioned. Um, uh, rates of adolescent suicide and self-harm were increasing even before the pandemic. And in California, uh, mental health illness is now the leading cause of hospitalization among children. I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, various hospitals about this and um, in, a, in another role I serve on, uh, on the um, uh, Loma Linda Children's Hospital uh, foundation board and we've in a discussion recently they were indicating that their emergency rooms were overrun uh, by children with with mental health crisis and it and, and this is real um, between the this ongoing crisis and young people's mental health and and covid's impact um, experts are speaking of a, of a looming tsunami of unmet needs among the youth and and we throughout this report we did hear of just um, um, just basic understaffing, not having enough people to meet the needs of, of children throughout our state. Um, and there's been reports that indicate that there have been increase in mental health related medical emergencies among children since the start of the pandemic, as I mentioned. Uh, so as a result, California needs to boldly and robustly address COVID's impact and support children's mental health needs. And I think it goes beyond just COVID. I think it's just uh, something we really need to focus on in general, but COVID has put a spotlight on it. And it's given an opportunity to, um, to, to take action now. And so with that, um, I will turn this over to Commissioner Beyer, who, uh, you know, who we can't thank enough for putting all this in motion. And it's such an important thing that, uh, that you know, I, think, um, I think his legacy will, will go on for a long time with regard to him, him moving this forward. So I will turn it over to Commissioner Beyer. Thank you, Commissioner Varner. I appreciate it very much. And, uh, I think the Little Hoover Commission has been served well by Chairman Nava because we've been able to focus in a bipartisan way in looking at difficult issues and with respect to mental health, looking at them over a period of time. This is actually our third mental health report in the last five years. Um, we looked at the general mental health scheme in 2015, 2016, uh, Proposition 63 and the Mental Health Services Act. So it was logical for us to turn to children's mental health, but I think what we've learned is the magnitude of the problem is far greater than what most people in the general populace understand. And I wanna repeat one thing that Commissioner Varner said, uh, right now mental health or mental illnesses are the leading cause of hospitalization for children in the state. 
That's stunning and a little known fact. But what's equally uh, disturbing is that California ranks 48th in the nation in providing needed mental health services to children. So we're the richest state and we're doing not such a good job with respect to mental health services for children. There's a recent Journal of the American Medical Association study out this last week, and it's a meta-analysis. That means it summarizes the findings of 29 different studies involving 80,000 children in the United States. And in some, it says uh, one quarter of children are clinically depressed and one fifth are severe, severely anxious to the point of needing mental health interventions. And that the situation has gotten worse, not just from before the pandemic, but during the pandemic. So the problem is growing as Commissioner Varner said. Let's turn to the report. Um, there are three main conclusions. One, and I won't go into details, but we can in Q and A. California has chosen consciously a decentralized, fragmented children's mental health system. And as earlier commission reports have pointed out, that does not work very well uh, because there's literally no one firmly and acutely in charge. Second, there's a shortage in terms of the number of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and community-based mental health uh, professionals. And the workforce does not fully represent the diversity in race, uh, gender, and uh, language skills that are needed to treat children in the state. And lastly, the funding mechanisms within the state are unbelievably complicated, and I would call them Byzantine, meaning you can't figure out who's on first most of the time. So when we looked at this, what did we conclude as a commission? What should be done? I think our number one recommendation is clear, consistent leadership. That is from the Department of Health and Human Services. There needs to be a single point of contact and leadership accountability. Um, we have commissions, we have oversight bodies, we have uh, division and delivery between counties and school districts and commercial health plans, but we need somebody at the top of the house who's looking at this and coming up with metrics to measure how many children are being counseled and what are their outcomes. We need to know what we're paying for and what's happening with respect to the health status of children through the funding provided by the state. The second, and the good news on this is that the legislature and Governor Newsom have put forward and passed a $4.4 billion mental health for children initiative. The challenge now is applying strong leadership to come up with actionable plans. This is complicated. There's $790 million allocated for a virtual portal so that children or their families can go online and secure services or at least know where to go. That's never been done at this scale before. Um, the country of Canada has begun this process and they have far fewer people than we have in the state of California. So that's gonna be a big challenge. A second area of focus is school-based care in the way of government, schools are separate from the state for the most part, but the state can provide technical assistance and support to help schools and school districts come up with and have actionable plans for dealing with the mental health problems of children. So in sum, what do we really recommend? We recommend somebody's in charge, they have a plan, the plan is measurable, and that there's accountability to the stakeholders in the process. That is the county, the state, school districts, and most importantly, parents and children. So with that, I will turn it back to Tristan and we can go and recognize the other uh, people who are gonna be speaking today. Thank you. Hello, this is Pedro. Let me jump in, Tristan. I wanna make, I, um, I make sure that we um, recognize that Commissioner Dion Ariner uh, has joined us. Uh, Commissioner Ariner, welcome. 
And maybe she doesn't want to speak. So why don't you go ahead, Tristan? Uh, thank you, Chair Nava. Hey, sorry. Um, thank, thank you, Pedro. Um, I'm listening intently. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner Aranor, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Nava, and uh, thank you also uh, to Commissioner Byer and to uh, Commissioner Byer and to Vice Chair Varner uh, for that fantastic summary of the Commission's uh, study and recommendations. And as Commissioner Byer indicated, uh, we're now going to move uh, to our guest speakers. Um, our first two guest speakers are Ted Limpert and LaShawn Francis uh, from Children Now, which is a nonpartisan research policy and advocacy organization organization that promotes uh, children's health and education. Uh, Ted Limpert is president of Children Now and a lecturer in the political science department at UC Berkeley. Previously, Mr. Limpert was a California State Assembly member representing San Mateo and Santa Clara counties from 1998 to 1992, and again from 1996 to 2000. Um, he also served on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors and was in, um, he was a founder of the county's um, Youth Commission and chaired the county's Task Force on Violence Against Women. And joining Mr. Limpert is LaShawn Francis, who is Director for Behavioral Health at Children Now. Uh, previously, Ms. Francis served as an Associate Director at the California Medical Association, um, and she has also worked at the Legislative Analyst Office and the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Mr. Limpert, uh, Ms. Francis, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, um, and we look forward to your presentation. Please. Thank you, and, and our pleasure. I will just make some very brief uh, opening comments and then turn it over to my uh, colleague, LaShawn Francis. And I, I want to just start by thanking the commissioners, the commission staff, but, uh, by Ethan for, uh, and for really putting a spotlight um, on kids and youth mental health. Uh, I as it was noted, I've been in politics and then in advocacy long enough that uh, we've used the word crisis over and over for a whole lot of issues. Uh, but when it comes to behavioral health, uh, it's, we're not overusing that term. Um, crisis is, is a completely accurate term before the pandemic. And, and, and now we're, the tsunami and, and, and what the, the situation is, is dire um, for our young people in terms of this issue. It cuts across so many youth. Some of the statistics were, were mentioned. We're saying in some cases, almost half of our youth with some degree of, of behavioral health issues and then major racial disparities. I mean, for example, the suicide rate and, uh, for a black youth in particular is so alarming. So really appreciate the commission's focus and their recommendations. We are making progress, just the fact that not only this, uh, the, the commission highlighting this issue, as was noted, the governor and legislature's investment, and really more the widespread prioritization of behavioral health. That said, as the commission is highlighting, we have a long ways to go. Imagine if a third to the half of the kids in this state had broken arms. We have an insurance and access system in place to ensure that most, if not all those kids got treatment for the broken arm. And yet somehow when it comes to mental health issues, we don't have that system in place to make sure that every child is, is getting uh, treated. Um, and then in terms of the recommendations, I'll just two very high level comments before I turn it over to LaShawn. Um, do appreciate them and I wanna put the emphasis on Starting early, I appreciate the birth to 26 uh, focus. And so often uh, when we look at addressing the needs of our young people, we often start too late. Um, so making sure that uh, as the governor and legislature and department uh, work on ensuring we have a, a truly accessible system for all that we start in the earliest years for our kids. And second, I, I would just note how important it is to make sure that the support is statewide and, and going to kids statewide and why we all know the importance of grant programs and pilot programs. This is such a crisis that we need to make sure uh, that all our kids are getting served statewide. And an example of that, the county school partnerships that the governor and legislature agreed to fund this year had started as a competitive program, but the governor and legislature recognized we need to get that kind of school-based program uh, to all um, counties that were ready to go. So again, appreciate the commission's leadership and I'm really honored to turn it over uh, to my amazing colleague, uh, LaShawn, to take it from here. Thanks so much, Ted. And thank you again to the commission for having us. 
we are in a rare position of having access to a lot of money that could be hugely impactful. So like they say, now the devil is in the details. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about today. What we've seen over the last year is the state's attempt to answer the problem of children's, of a children's mental health crisis. And this investment of over $4 billion, it's fiscally ambitious. And we're really excited to see that. But let's take the example of the broken arm that Ted just talked about. If we found out that there was a particular park with a slide contributing to the majority of broken arms of children, we would remove that slide. So one thing that we actually aren't asking right now is how do we create environments for children where they can thrive, right? Most of our focus is if they have a broken arm, we should fix it, which we want because we know that broken arms will happen. But what we are also seeing is that we have environments that are untenable for children. We have environments that aren't always loving, that don't always have a caring adult, that aren't safe. And those are the questions that we also need to be asking as we think about what it means for children to be emotionally well. So while we're excited to see this $4 billion investment, we're saying we need to start asking some deeper level questions about prevention and early intervention to really have a lasting impact when it comes to children and youth. But I will say this, some of the tenets and principles in the initiative gets us excited, like it being payer agnostic, it requiring interagency collaboration, and it being focused on the zero to five population. We know that there isn't enough focus on early childhood or transition age youth as it stands. So we're really excited to see the scope and breadth of the initiative, and that is truly commendable. What we're going to be watching for in the initiative are a few things, and some of them were highlighted in the commission's report, specifically setting outcome goals. You know, I'll add the caveat being that those outcome goals have to be steeped in reducing racial disparities. So we can't just focus on increasing the number of children who get screened for depression, for example. We have to increase the number of black and brown children who are screened for, the, for depression. The good news is if we do this, we will also improve the outcomes of white children. Systems that are failing communities of color are actually failing all of us. So by focusing on the most, on those most impacted by the system of poverty and racism, we can actually improve the outcomes of all groups. But I will say that it's hard to focus on outcome goals when you're not really collecting the data that you need. Children Now just released a report examining all of the publicly reported data on children's mental health, and we found a large gap in consumer feedback. So it begs the question, how will we know the system we've created is responding to the needs of children and families if we have no idea what it is they're asking for? It's one of the reasons we're hoping to see real consumer feedback in the work groups that are, be create, that are being formed for the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. We know that feedback has to be solicited early and often, and work groups can't be formed first and then feedback solicited last. That's not authentic consumer feedback, and it'll likely leave the state disappointed in the response to their plan if folks aren't brought in on the ground early and often. You all mentioned the investment in schools and censoring schools, and we're really, really excited to see those investments. This last year's budget had multiple school-related investments. There was the $400 million dedicated at incentive payments to Medi-Cal managed care plans. There was the large investment in community schools with a heavy uh, mental health focus. There were the school-county partnerships through the Oversight and Accountability Commission. And really what this led to is a rare moment of schools having received an abundance of dollars in this past year and a lot of confusion around how those dollars can be used and what the parameters are with those dollars and what the allowable expenses are, right? So we're hoping the state can help schools and districts wade through the confusion of multiple funding sources that might have multiple goals and activities attached to those fun funding sources. And finally, I'll flag one piece of the initiative that's not talked about very often, and that's the $100 million investment in public education about toxic stress. We think it's vital that every family understands how toxic stress shows up in the body, both physically and mentally. It's why we sponsored Senate Bill 428 this year, which will allow commercial insurance companies to cover trauma screenings. As you know, in the past, trauma screenings have been limited to the Medi-Cal population. And if you understand the science of toxic stress, you understand that that's not limited to those in poverty. So in an effort to remove the stigma of poverty and to ensure that we weren't pathologizing poverty, we ran SB 428, which was ultimately signed by the, by the governor. All of these 
various efforts within the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative have the opportunity to be transformative. What we'd like to see is a greater focus on ensuring we're closing gaps of racial disparity as we think about outcomes. We'd like to see more focus in helping schools and districts figure out how to spend the mental health dollars in a cohesive and coordinated fashion. And we'd love to see the state really go out of its way to make sure that they're educating communities in the fashion that they can receive the information, whether it's by language or, or other cultural competence as we think about toxic stress. So those are the things that Children Now is looking forward to um, in the coming year or in the next five years, really, as this initiative rolls out interest and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Francis and uh, uh, Mr. Limper for that great presentation. And uh, Ms. Francis, we will be uh, saving Q&A for uh, a joint Q&A after we hear from our next uh, speaker, who will be uh, Christine Stoner Mertz. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Christine Stoner Mertz, who is CEO of the California Alliance of Child and Family Services, which is a 150 uh, member association that represents organizations serving children, youth, and families families uh, throughout California. Previously from 2005 to 2019, um, Ms. Stoner Mertz served as president and CEO of Lincoln, an agency delivering community-based behavioral health services in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Ms. Stoner Mertz, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thank you so much for having me, Tristan, commissioners. Um, it's such a, a great opportunity to address you again on this critical and urgent issue of children's mental health in California. Um, as, as you all know, I'm the CEO of the California Alliance, which represents over 150 nonprofit providing, uh, nonprofits providing services to children, youth, and families throughout California. Um, our members are doing work in prevention, school-based mental health services, a range of behavioral health services in the community and education supports, as well as foster care and more intensive services such as residential treatment. So we, we see on the ground all of the issues that you're trying to address and that, that your report is, is so thoroughly reviews. Um, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that I feel grateful for living in a state that is working hard to take this issue of children's mental health seriously. Um, we know we have a long way to go, but, but the time that you all have taken to, to listen to testimony and, and provide a report, um, we have our first ever Surgeon General who's a pediatrician. We have a Secretary of Health and Human Services that's a, that is a pediatrician. We have a superintendent of public instruction that has built a mental health coalition, countless others in leadership roles in the state who are paying attention to children's mental health issues at a level I don't think we've seen in California before. It doesn't change what, uh, what commissioner, commissioners uh, Varner and Bayer said that, that we still have a long way to go um, and there's a lot to critique, but I don't wanna lose sight of, we have some great leadership and attention on this issue. But we're still challenged by workforce. We, we are still challenged by our approach to trauma and poverty and the lack of some artic our clearly articulated goals for the children's mental health system. Uh, as many of you have noted, as schools open this fall, we've seen the effects of the pandemic on students. And in many cases, we continue um, to see students disengaged I hope we'll all be mindful that as we look at this larger long-term um, effort that we need to be attending to, that, that we also look at the immediate needs. And as, as Ted said, this really truly is a crisis. Um, we have unmet mental health needs manifesting themselves uh, and not just in our students, but also teachers and school personnel and, and others. Um, but most impacted are those foster youth, youth from low income households and English learners. Uh, we've seen heightened anxiety and depression and the effects of social isolation. Uh, many of you've seen articles in the San Francisco Chronicle, one that reported on an increase in fighting and, and uh, on campuses as students brought their unmet social, emotional and mental health needs back to school 
More recently, an LA Times analysis of student assessment results um, saw that, that elementary school learning scores had dropped overall by seven percentage points and even more for black and Latino students. The gap for those groups and uh, compared to their white and Asian classmates is now 26 percentage points. Um, it, the Journal of Pediatrics has estimated that 175,000 children in the U.S. have lost a parent or guardian caregiver to COVID-19, and most of these children come from racial and ethnic minority groups. It just underscores the urgency for state and local governments to act now. You have highlighted the critical issue of workforce in your report. There are both urgent needs to address this and long-term efforts we have to put in place across the state. Um, for nonprofits in particular, serving low-income communities, salaries for behavioral health staff are at least 30% lower than others serving in public systems. This has made them the most vulnerable to competition from large healthcare providers, county behavioral health departments and schools and we've designed a system in which those who want to serve their own communities cannot afford to do that through nonprofit organizations due to the compensation that's made available through behavioral health contracts or, and the low reimbursement rates. So we have to urgently address this and other issues through one-time supports to the behavioral health field, including things like grants to nonprofit community-based providers loan forgiveness, tuition reimbursement, or one-time financial supports to retain staff. We also have to look at, and you've addressed this as well in your report, the regulatory and contractual issues that impact how quickly new staff can be brought on. There are so many things we could be, we could be putting in place now, just as we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, when we saw executive orders coming out on an almost daily basis for some time. But we've got to act now to, to look at what's keeping us from being able to create the workforce that we need. The $4.4 billion child, Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative does offer tremendous new opportunities to advance access to services. But uh, we've got to look at how we're implementing, uh, and I think LaShawn addressed this, uh, how are we implementing and then how are we evaluating the use of those funds. Funding for coaches and schools can support new positions that would allow a new career path and increasing opportunities for peers to be able to serve in behavioral health roles. Some of this can be starting now using the one-time funds available to schools to create supports for students. Not every mental health staff needs to have a master's degree. They do need to be well-trained and they need to be supervised, but there are models that currently exist and that could be implemented across districts in partnership with CBOs. We also see the need to engage community colleges in the development of apprenticeships in behavioral health, helping students begin early in their educational career to learn about work in children's mental health. And we'd like to see that funding that supports this effort, either through the Behavioral Health Initiative or new funding in the 2022 budget. You talked about schools as hubs, helping schools to become the hubs of student wellness is a good first step and many school leaders have engaged in this process. We're part of a coalition that's building a field guide for education leaders with the help of experts in mental health, financing, community schools, expanded learning and more. This will be available in early 2022 to help local leaders build on their school wellness efforts and create sustainable approaches to support students. We have to remember this is a marathon. It's not gonna be a sprint. It's gonna take time for students to heal from, from the impact of COVID-19 and all of the ongoing issues that impact their mental health. We also feel uh, the need to address and, and comment on the substance use workforce. We have 
real concerns related to the dearth of substance use programs for youth and the trained substance use staff. Again, the low reimbursement rates have kept many children's behavioral health providers from developing these programs. And even with increased funding for infrastructure outlined in the behavioral health initiative, if we don't increase rates for those programs, those programs can't be stopped properly staffed. CalAIM payment reform changes could positively impact this, but it's not clear just yet how provider rates will be developed under CalAIM. Other changes that CalAIM is putting in place that we look forward to seeing in January 2022 include a change to the front door that will allow behavioral health providers to immediately serve children and youth based on criteria that includes being involved in the child welfare or juvenile justice systems, being homeless or scoring in a high risk range on a trauma screening tool. The challenge of course here is how are we going to meet the needs of more youth having access through that front door when we already have a workforce crisis and can't meet the needs that we're identifying today. Um, you've addressed the question of statewide approach. We appreciate the commission's assertion that having a singular state focus on behavioral health would be beneficial, particularly as it relates to children's mental health. The essential question is how much authority will that entity have to design and implement the system of care that's truly needed to meet the needs of California's children and youth. Given the financial structures created with realignment, it may be challenging, even with strong leadership, to effectively implement consistent approaches statewide. We do, however, believe that for those very complex behavioral, developmental, and substance use needs that many youth do have, um, cannot be met with unless we combine the efforts of state agencies that are responsible for these youth. So we need CDSS, DHCS, DDS, and CDE at the table developing a state level intervention approach to serve these youth who do have those most complex needs. We have to address the trauma that exists and LaShawn talked about it um, and the relationship to poverty. There's been public education about adverse childhood experiences on children and youth across the state. The Surgeon General's focus has ensured a greater understanding of how we think about the impacts of trauma and children's developing brains and why we need to ask what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. However, we continue to deal with the impacts of institutional policies that contain bias at best and in some cases are rooted in systemic racism. Well-intentioned policies such as those that outline that ACEs screeners are also likely mandated reporters of child abuse can create significant barriers that will keep many people from asking for the help they need. How do we move away from intervening with families identified as neglectful, as requiring child welfare involvement, and instead address their basic needs and their trauma, particularly in light of how COVID-19 has impacted families? Addressing poverty also addresses children's mental health. You've also noted that goals have to be identified, clear and actionable goals to address children's mental health needs um, that include access to care, quality of care, and overall mental well being. The governor's recent appointment of Melissa Stafford Jones as the director of Ch the Child and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative is heartening, given her experience as a regional director for HHS working on healthcare reform. And Children Now's report on the need for the, a robust data system um, in children's mental health outlines data that data gathering methods have to identify what we should be looking at. We also have to look at integrated systems and having clear goals and metrics to review whatever those goals are will assist us in identifying gaps 
in our public and private behavioral health systems. We also have to have those goals relate to racial equity and ensure access to underserved communities, including LGBTQ plus youth. Finally, um, in addition to some of the suggestions I've already covered, again, an emphasis on workforce investment now and ongoing. The reduction in administrative burdens and roadblocks to care. Um, it should be as easy for a low income parent to get access to care for their child as it is for someone to, who can write a check to do that. Our financing mechanisms must be secondary to getting care to children and youth. And state government can lead the way on that and local governments will hopefully follow. We need increased use of community defined practices that address the cultural needs of all Californians, the use of spiritual leaders, promotores and others defined by the individual seeking care must be more integrated into our public and private systems. And finally, as you note in your report, robust statewide technical assistance to schools, health plans, behavioral health leaders on the financing of children's mental health services and how to maximize funding and partnerships to serve every child's behavioral health needs. Um, we are so grateful to share these thoughts with all of you and look forward to a robust question and answer. Thank you again, commissioners. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Stoner Mertz, for that uh, a great presentation. Um, we're going to move now to the uh, question and answer portion of the webinar. And this uh, Q&A will go to uh, 1 p.m., which gives us about 20 minutes uh, for audience uh, questions. Um, if you're joining us through Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to submit uh, questions uh, to the speakers. And if you're joining us by phone, you can uh, email your questions to uh, littlehoover at lhc.ca. Um, dot gov. Now, to respect uh, everyone's time, we may be combining similar uh, questions when directing them uh, to the speakers. And also, if we don't get to your question, um, we will be sharing contact information after the webinar, uh, so you will have the opportunity to follow up uh, with our presenters that way. And finally, um, we're also going to be holding a public comment uh, session at the end of this meeting. So if you wish to make a comment instead of a question, we ask that you please save your uh, comment um, un until the end of the meeting. Um, and so with that, uh, we will go to our questions. And um, I think this is one that actually um, uh, I would like to uh, direct both to um, uh, Ms. Stoner Mertz and to um, uh, Ms. Francis, um, because you, you both of you uh, touched on this element. Um, so the question is that one major systemic issue um, is that within the uh, children's mental health system, each organization speaks a different language. Um, getting DHCS and schools to understand each other and successfully work together, for example, has been an ongoing effort for years and still has a long way to go. Um, now, the uh, as Commissioner uh, Byer mentioned in his uh, summary of the recommendations, this is something that the commission's report um, uh, addresses um, through encouraging um, a, a greater part through uh, state support for greater uh, partnership and state uh, incentives for greater partnership. But also, I would really like to hear uh, both from uh, you, Ms. Stoner Mertz, and then from Ms. Francis um, about how you think um, the state can uh, uh, support this kind of partnership and especially help to address the roadblocks between the, uh, uh, the problems of communication, the problems of language that separate the different players in this field. Okay, I was waiting for LaShawn to go off mute, <laughs> but I see she, I'll jump in. Um, I, you know, I, I do think that um, some inroads are being made. I, I, when we, we've had several work groups that really have begun to bring those organizations together at the state level, I think it's going to continue to need to be something that gets brought to the table and um, certainly community-based organizations who are often, you know, uh, in, intersecting with all of these different public agencies do see that. And so I think hearing from parents about what those struggles are and then trying to address 
those needs at both a state level, but also a local level. And AB 2083 began to develop um, systems of care that have public agencies meeting now on a regular basis, creating MOUs. Education has got to be a key partner in that. And I think originally probably was not brought in in the way that it could have been, but we, ha we really have to have every child serving organization um, in those conversations, both at the state level and at the local level. Um, and we have to listen to each other, right? When, when an educator uses language like social emotional learning, that, that, might, be, that might be considered mental health speak. Um, we, have to, we have to understand the languages. We also have to have people involved in these conversations who can do some of that translation. And those, those folks are out there. We just need to bring them in and make sure that they're part of the conversation. Yeah, I think Chris is absolutely right. I do think that inroads have been made. We saw what happened with SB 75 recently, and that was a Medi-Cal work group that involved CDE and DHCS really coming to the table to work out some of the kinks around Medi-Cal billing for student health. I do think, though, that there is something a little bit less tangible happening here, and that's simply the issue of relationships and trust between departments. And I think it's why it's so important when we talk about who's in charge and who is holding space and who's holding responsibility and that centralized responsibility that the report, the commissioner's report talks about. Because what that would mean is that, you know, currently the way it works is, you know, no, no one is the chief of anyone, right? They, they, can, they can get in a room and talk and agree to disagree and then go about their, their business as usual. But there isn't someone, an entity, an individual in place that says, no, you have, you must do X, Y, and Z, you must do A, B, and C, it's still too reliant on who's in charge and whether or not those relationships are strong enough for folks to work together. Yeah, this is, this is um, Pedro, let me just sort of step in only because I, I see we've got a couple of hands raised. Um, I'm assuming Mr. Or Commissioner Byer raised his hand before Commissioner Ariner or uh, Okay. I, I deferred, Pedro. I, I deferred to, to Commissioner Ariner. Too late. Too late, Commissioner uh, Ariner. You're up. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of our presenters. Really, this has been a, an interesting conversation. One thing that I, I think I'm feeling is missing is the role of the consumers in this discussion. And by that, I don't mean the parents. I mean the children. Um, and the example I guess I have um, that I learned many, many years ago during the 90s actually, is when foster care kids came to the legislature um, with their set of problems directly as opposed to having them translated through parents or providers or government people, right? The CYC, the Child, you know, California Youth Connection was formed then. And the impact that it's had, I think anyway, it's, my, it's in my opinion, the impact that it's had on the foster care system has been dramatic. And so the question here is, is how, how are we gonna hear from consumers? I'm presuming as young as nine years old, maybe eight years old, right? Um, who can tell us a lot about how they're feeling and what the trauma is that they've been, you know, that they've experienced um, and also what they need. And so how does anybody envision that happening? Well, I would uh, just say it's a tremendous question, uh, Commissioner Ariner, and there are some established ways that need to happen more. I mean, a number of counties have county youth commissions. You know, most school boards have a, a county, have a student member, and, and those are not just a show. I mean, we really need to empower young people to, to speak up at those official means, and I think one thing the state needs to do is do an overview of its own decision-making pro process as local governments are getting better still a long ways to go as having official youth representation, you know, let's ensure that's happening at the state level as well. And my panelists might have some other thoughts also. Commissioner Beyer, looks like. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, uh, Chair Nava. Um, I, I have a question for the 
folks who, who, who talked, one of the recommendations we made um, is derived from the experience in the Obama administration on education reform. And the program was called Race to the Top. And it worked, I believe, pretty well because it set standards for uh, states to apply for money on education reform. But before you could apply, you actually had to change something. And so there was an incentive for all states who wanted to participate to change, even if they didn't win all of the money. And it had a net effect of rising uh, all boats. And so we recommended that in the context of schools. In other words, to try and get schools to have a minimum standard of child well-being, child mental health interventions. But once they'd done that, that they could apply for additional funds that is setting aside some money. That was a carrot slash stick approach that we recommended. And I would love to hear feedback on it because it begins the process of creating uh, a nudge to the school districts and the schools so that they get something out of it, but they also have reformed along the way. So any feedback would be welcome. I think the silence is because everyone understands that that can also be a very touchy subject. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to respond. You know, I, I think that what you would hear is from us at least is that there, there does need to be a basic understanding of what we're trying to do. I'm not sure exactly how it could be phrased. I think that if we talked a little bit more generally around measures that said something like, reduce the number of school days missed due to depression, right? I think everyone could get behind something like that. So I do think that when we're talking about, you know, the, the thing that we want to change, how it's framed would be really important to see what, how receptive folks would be when we start talking about a floor for, for different schools and districts. Yeah, the, but the problem we're facing um, is incoherence and, uh, a combination of the urgency of now and the incoherence of everything's first. And so I'm trying to figure out if you were in charge, what's first? And, and, and let's just stick within the subsect of uh, schools and school districts. We, I don't believe we can let every school or school district go off on their own and do whatever program they want and apply for grants and not have any oversight, also known as today. I'm exaggerating, but to make a point, how do we change that dynamic so that all students, all youth in California schools have some access to a minimum level of benefits or care? I think, I think the idea that we have those kinds of metrics as uh, LaShawn is offering is, is one of the ways we do that. Um, the, the one question or concern I would have around competitiveness is that you often will find those less resourced school districts or localities um, feeling like they can't even compete, right? Um, we see this with nonprofits, often smaller nonprofits that are frankly much closer to those youth and those families and really understand and are embedded in their community simply don't have the infrastructure even to put together a grant. So how do you ensure that as you are identifying the top three goals um, and saying, we want everyone to be addressing how they're gonna meet these goals. We also ensure that the resources um, for across the state are available to those schools and, and organizations that you know, may not have the capacity and infrastructure to do what, what larger um, localities could do. So that, that would be one thing. And I could just make one comment about um, to Commissioner Ariner. Uh, I could not agree with you more that we have to be having youth at the table. Um, I spoke to a couple of youth just the other day who are looking to develop peer counseling efforts in their schools and want help with how do we build the infrastructure? How do we identify the practice? 
um, we've really got to bring them into the conversation. So I'm so glad that you said that. Thanks. And and it can't just be a token, right? I mean, Absolutely. when when people aren't interested in being, aren't haven't been trained how to be at the table, that means that they need the support system so that they can be at the table and and not feel that they're just a token. And I would just just submit briefly, and Commissioner Bias Chris as well. It actually goes back to the first question of schools and health systems um, collaborating. So rather than a com competitive model, which I think Lashawn and Chris highlighted some uh, concerns of that is at least models where that cooperation has to be in, in, embedded. So schools or county are going off on their own. And I think that's one thing the state can require in terms of ensuring that cooperation among health and education. I understand that they're doing, there's some pilot programs going on right now with wellness centers in high schools. And um, I don't know if that's a, a broad-based solution, but when you talked about that, um, some of that peer-to-peer -peer counseling or, or education in that area, it seems like having a place on campus would be, would be a benefit. I know there's a lack of resources for that, but have any of you looked at that? And is there any value to looking further at these pilot programs throughout the state on wellness centers within the high schools? I think huge value, Commissioner Varner. And, and it might look different depending on the age group that you are serving. You know, I, I when you say, when you describe that, I also think for elementary school age youth, having a family resource center on campus, that not just for the child, but also for family members, right? To get the supports they need to support the child. Um, having a place identified is uh, is one very concrete way to start to address that need and also leadership among school leaders i think mm -hmm. you know we when i was a provider we did services in pittsburgh unified school district and the superintendent was very serious when she said i want every child in my school district to have access to mental health right services and and gosh darn it she did it right and now she's built community schools and um and it required bringing everyone to the table county behavioral health um providers parents youth and but it can be done and uh and and it really is uh, um, going back to what LaShawn said relationship right yeah. And, yeah, and I'll, I'll just actually add on to what Chris is saying in that I think for a lot of us, we, especially those of us who love going into the details, and that includes myself, we get really caught up with what works. Is it the wellness center? Is it the community school? Is it the school-based health center? And the reality is the question that we should really be asking is, how do we get mental health services to kids on campus? And the model that works for you is probably going to depend on what region you live in, your population base, how much money you have. But that should be the first question and requirement. The requirement should be in whatever form it is, you have access to something on campus. And I think that's more of how we have been supporting and thinking about these pilot programs. And we've talked the last time that, that we were here on the webinar, we talked about the state's obsession with pilot programs and not scaling yeah, any of them. Right. So, <laughs> right? So at some point we have to double down and just say, hey, everyone, here is a chunk of money to ensure that kids have access to some kind of service on campus. I just want to point out one thing that I, I learned a fact a couple of weeks ago. So there are 1,100 school districts in the state of California. 555% of them are considered small districts. That means it could be a, as small as um, a almost a one-person schoolhouse, meaning the superintendent is the teacher. He's also the bookkeeper. He's also the janitor, right? He has no planning capacity whatsoever. So small districts have very little planning capacity. And so if we don't, it's one thing to come up with all of the ideas and then to give them, even to give them the chunk of change, if they can't figure out what to do with the chunk of change, we need to do something statewide regarding technical assistance so that um, so the districts, right, have the, have the capacity, right? Because if we're gonna do this statewide, then they need, there needs to be some equity amongst districts. Um, and when you think about it, 55% of them are small districts. That means probably most of them don't have a planning department, not even a planning person, maybe except the superintendent. 
Yeah, that's a that's a very important point. Yeah, I think you know what a one of the things I heard that made a real impact on me was um, uh, when it was said, instead of what happened, you know, asking what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you is such a critical pivot from from burdening a child with blame, those things over which they had no control. And I think another part of what we're going to have to uh, be sensitive to and cognitive and work on is children. They're gonna the, the ones who get help will be better off than the ones that don't, obviously. But we are likely to have large numbers of children who are disturbed, unhappy, and angry, and they spend most of their day in school. And when they act out, that's where they're likely going to do it. And so how do we, what is it that we do to minimize the, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the harm that is caused to children through discipline that is imposed and applied to them? Because kids are going to act out. And if administrators aren't educated to ask what happened to you and instead are saying what's wrong with you, you know what the consequences are going to be. The consequences are that child is going to be identified as a problem. And it's been my experience, my own, that if I get good at being a problem, that's what I'm going to do. Because that's what I'm going to learn how to do. And that's how I'm going to get my attention, negative attention as it is. But I will at least have someone that recognizes I'm in the room for as long as they let me stay in the room. And so I think, you know, part of what we have to talk about is, is how do we humanely uh, care for uh, children who will be acting out and who are disruptive? and who have pain um, uh, so that we don't by demanding order make it worse uh, for for them as well um, and you're you're speaking to somebody who spent you know <laughs> a fair amount of time locked in a closet in the classroom um because i was a horrible behavioral problem um you know and so they made in my case they made a mistake of leaving the wooden blocks in the closet where they placed me so I would build things in there until they fell over and made even more noise, which I then got kicked out of the room entirely. Uh, so, you know, somehow I managed to survive, but we all know that there are children for whom those experiences are horribly scarring and it changes them, you know, forever. Um, so as we talk about providing, you know, mental health services for children, I think a part of what we also have to keep in mind is how do we how do we temper the response by administrators and teachers to children who act out so that we don't in fact make it worse for them. Commissioner, I think that's exactly you know what we were thinking of when we talked about creating the right environments for children to be able to thrive. That includes in schools. That includes the highly punitive disciplinary measures that you know children now and other groups on here have been trying to combat the last few years. I do know that there are some schools and districts who are talking about just that. How do you respond uh, in terms of discipline coming out of COVID? So I know that those conversations are ongoing, but that's exactly the point. You know, how, how do we create environments where children feel supported and loved and not penalized? Thank you. And I think, you know, I, I, I said this as I, in my talking points about this is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> um, I, I imagine that educators are also feeling enormous pressure around getting children's learning losses taken care of, right? That, that they see that as, as their top priority. But we also have to let them breathe to say, you know what, if the lesson doesn't get done and what you're doing is talking to your students about or bringing in support to talk to your students about how they've been impacted and what's happening for them right now, then 
maybe that's what should be the priority for right, right this moment. It doesn't mean we're not gonna address the learning loss because that's critical as well. And they go together, they go hand in hand, but, um, but we also have to make sure we're creating that space using things like restorative justice as ways to, to manage conflict um, and other kinds of interventions and support. So my hope is that those coaches that are um, articulated in the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative might actually be some of the folks that could help assist schools with that. Um, I, th I think it is, it is time now that we uh, move on uh, to public comment. We've gone beyond 1 p.m. But before we move to public comment, I just want to uh, uh, thank the commissioners and our guest speakers for uh, this incredibly rich and informative uh, uh, conversation. Um, this has really been excellent. And um, uh, I, I know I appreciate it. And I hope that the audience members do uh, appreciate it as much as I do. Um, but we will now be moving uh, to um, public comment. Um, if you would like to make a public comment and are joining us by Zoom, uh, please use the uh, raised hand feature uh, so that staff will know to, um, uh, unmute, uh, to unmute you. And if you are joining us by phone, um, you can please send an email to littlehoover at lhc.ca.gov. Um, that includes your name, the phone number, uh, and the phone number from which you're calling so that staff will know uh, whom to unmute. Um, and uh, as we move to public comment, I would like to uh, remind uh, audience members that as is usual with Little Hoover, um, we do ask that you please limit your public comments uh, to three minutes. Um, and with that, um, Ashley, Rachel, uh, do we have any audience members who have indicated they wish to make a public comment? Yes, first up, we've got Linda Copeland. Linda, you may begin your public comment. Uh, thanks so much. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician and a board certified behavior analyst. So I had a question about how to get the California Association of Behavior Analysts uh, with their tens and tens of thousands of membership of uh, certified um, behavioral um, therapists, uh, how to get them to be a part of this building this workforce capacity. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Linda, for, uh, for that uh, uh, comment and question. And I should also just take this opportunity to uh, uh, say again that um, we will be sharing contact information um, following the webinar. Uh, so um, we would, uh, so you will have the ability to follow up with presenters. And um, audience members are also, of course, more than welcome to uh, direct any questions uh, uh, to the commission as well. Um, Ashley, uh, Rachel, um, any additional uh, uh, public comments? At this moment, there are no raised hands on Zoom and we have not received any emails. Okay, um, I think with that, um, I think the only thing left to do, um, I, I, I see uh, Chair uh, Nava, you have uh, unmuted yourself. So, um, if, uh, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, no, no, you're doing, you're doing great. I'm going back to mute. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Chair Nava. Um, I think with that, uh, the only thing left is to once again uh, thank uh, the commissioners and our uh, guest participants, um, Mr. Limpard, uh, Ms. Francis, and Ms. Stoner Mertz, uh, for your participation, for your excellent pr uh, uh, presentations, and for such a uh, rich and informative uh, conversation. And also, thanks to all of our audience members uh, uh, for taking the time to tune into this webinar. Thank you all.